And so I'm looking at the list. So we have here Canada, India, Turkey, uh, all from Romania, uh, Pakistan. Uh, so we have quite a Switzerland. Do we have at least two people from the same country? It looks like everybody's from somewhere else. Kenya, Portugal. Uh, again, Kenya, okay, we have the United States, very nice. Um, okay, and I'm adding here Teet um, and Alcan. Okay, very nice. All right, well, so as you all know, many things have happened in the past several weeks, and all of a sudden, uh, we all now have to teach online. Not a big change for me. I was teaching online this semester anyway, but I know for many professors, uh, they literally had a couple of days to switch from face to face to online. And uh, we have received uh, probably at least 15 professors contacted me asking all kinds of questions like what do you use to record your video lectures? What do you do? What, what, what platform do you use to post your materials for the students? But also a lot of questions from the students. How do I go about it? What happens? And I thought instead of uh, answering those questions one by one and relying on my experience only, um, we would reach out to our wonderful professors who have taught online for a while and maybe ask them to um, share their experience. And so we have here about eight, nine, ten of them. So if you can maybe take a quick turn and just introduce yourself, tell us where you are and uh, your name, your university. Uh, I'm not sure which order we want to go in. Just unmute your microphone and go, go ahead. So who wants to go first? On my screen. Hi, this is Anne Marie. Yeah, Anna Marie. Yeah. So where okay. are you, Anne Marie? So I am in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, we woke up to the news today that we are on full quarantine, the whole entire country, until mid-April. Um, and I work in Universidad de la Sabana. Very nice. Nice to meet you, or nice to see you again. Uh, who, who goes next? Uh, okay. Alex, uh, yeah. Let's make sure you can unmute your microphones. Yeah. Okay. Alex? Which one did you <laughs> Okay, oh, yeah. so yeah. Alex. I'm Alex Aswad. I'm in Belmont, uh, Nashville. Tennessee, I've just made my way back from Egypt. It was quite an interesting trip back. Um, I'm pretty sure I've caught the virus. So uh, <laughs> I'm now self-quarantined for two weeks. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I've been teaching online for 10 years, so I hope I can help as well. Yeah, and you made it back to the United States, something like the last flight before they canceled all the international flights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, very nice. Uh, Toshia, you, you, you next? Yes. Hi, uh, Bas, and hi, everybody. I'm Toshio Ozaki from Japan. Uh, I just finished uh, teaching the full course at, uh, in Vietnam online, and this was a very fast experience for me, so I'm really looking forward to listening to your insights. So is Japan on the lockdown as well because of the... Uh, yes, uh, we, 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 we plan to start, the, I mean, we plan to resume the academic year online uh, so this is a very new experience for all of us any decision on the olympic games yet uh, oh this is a very controversial topic uh, uh, i don't know where we are going yeah okay well i don't know who wants to go next on my screen justin is listed as uh in the kind of corner so he would be the next one Okay, so um, I'm born and raised in Canada, did my studies in the States. I, I'm fairly involved with the ex-culture research side. Um, and currently I'm working for Mei Fa Long University in uh, Chiang Rai, uh, Thailand. And unfortunately, just today we got our first COVID-19 test come back positive. So it's come to our city. Huh, okay, a little later, yeah. And Justin is helping us a lot on the research side, so data preparation and uh, data analysis. So those of you who requested data, some of the delays, uh, the delays are caused by me, but some of the help with preparing the data and processing the data comes from, from Justin. Uh, Jennifer, you're next on my screen, so uh, I, I don't know which order you see each other, but maybe if you can introduce yourself. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lee, and I'm a professor of management at Nazareth College in Rochester, New York. Here in the United States, yes. Here in the United States, Here yes. And my expertise is more in hybrid learning and intensive technology integration. So I'll speak about it from that perspective in that many of us aren't necessarily, uh, you know, full-time online instructors, but thinking about, you know, this as a two-part uh, two play for many of us instructing in this moment. 
So does it count as hybrid if half of the semester was face to face and the other half is online? <laughs> yes. Yes, it would. Yeah. So, um, Ernesto, I guess you are on my my screen. Yes. Uh, Ernesto Tavoletti from the University of Macerata, Italy. So I am actually in the world epicenter of uh, coronavirus right now. Uh, the news is that we have been overcoming China. Uh, yesterday has a number of deaths. Uh, so actually here the level of um, anxiety is, um, is pretty strong. I am not very far away from Milan. It is 500 um, kilometers. And so actually we were forced to, to go online. Uh, there are many uh, yeah, many positive cases around and uh, so yes I am very interested about uh, teaching online and I also want to, to report my small experience thanks to the advice that Bas has been giving me and I'm very satisfied about I have to say online teaching so and curious to hear about your experiences too. Yeah. And Ernesto is um, um, also involved in all kinds of exculture activities, so hosted one of the symposia, very heavily involved in research, so um, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I think on my screen then Alka and then Teet, and then we can start talking, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Alka from MIT, uh, MIT University, India. And we just have a very short uh, time when we have started teaching online, because again in India, we are in a situation where uh, the number of uh, COVID is spreading really fast. So it, since uh, Monday only, we have switched on to the online mode. So we have started uh, taking classes towards the end of the semester. So we had few classes face to face and currently we are teaching from our home uh, to the online mode. Right, yeah. Very nice to meet you too. Uh, Teet, please. Um, no. Hello, uh, my name is Teet Teron. I'm working in Estonia at the Student Business School. We have actually used uh, online learning uh, in Canvas, in Moodle, no, several years, but, uh, but in, indeed also we have been in Xculture. But maybe the new thing is really to have such a, uh, not only blended learning, uh, but also combination of uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning. Because especially if you have to have uh, real-time uh, classes with um, uh, people from different countries or uh, people who are uh, don't have English as a native language. La that's a bit a new experience. Right. Uh, at least in our culture where people are not so active in raising their hand all <laughs> the time and so you have to use some special tools. That's a good point, yes. Okay, very nice. And we have Paula and Abrahim. Go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Paula Musuva, Dr. Paula Musuva from Kenya. I'm not sure I should be on this panel. Oh, um, okay. I've, I've, I've uh, been teaching online for the last one week uh, from uh -huh, USIU uh -huh. uh, Africa. And uh, I would be glad to drop off the panel. Uh, I think I answered the question okay. too fast, uh, Maybe, Bas, so. Right. But if you have any questions, you have nine panelists here who will be able to help you. So if you experienced any challenges. So, very nice. And Abraham, do you have the microphone here? Or um, I'm not sure I don't see a picture. Um, all right, we'll get to Abraham later. So if you don't mind, so instead of doing presentations and you know, lectures on how to do things, we actually received some very specific questions, as I said, over the last few weeks. And let me ask you those questions. For example, one question that everybody is asking is, would it be advisable to record video lectures and show students the basic recordings, MP4 file or YouTube streaming or uh, whatever platform that those video lectures are posted on? Or would it be advisable to have live meetings where every student has to be present in a virtual classroom at the same time or not to do any video? So what, what is your take on that? What, what is your recommendation? I've tried all three and I still don't know which one is the best. Alex, go ahead, please. My answer from, you know, I'm a strategy person, so I think of it from primarily from a strategic perspective. I think everyone has to think of where they are in their semester and their class and the content of the class before they get themselves tied up in video editing. Um, they can get, even, even voiceover PowerPoints can get complicated. So I think it's about answering, am I finishing up the last quarter of the semester, the last half of the semester? Or am I, do I have a mandate to go to the end of the year with what I develop? 
um, to answer those sort of questions, and then second, the material, right? I mean, I think each each course or each discipline has lends itself um, less or more to to that sort of thing. And then if if there are requirements, I mean, I, I say this to my students, I'm finishing up the last two weeks of an international business class. Um, I'm going to send them to the Vast Taras YouTube page <laughs> because that's about the best one I have with someone. If you're teaching just simple lectures, I, I use the same book as him and, and so forth. So um, I think being pragmatic is what I'm trying to, is my message. Actually, I never thought about that, Alex, but uh, yes, if you don't want to create your own video lectures, but you want to use them, if you Google my name on YouTube, uh, I do have a full collection of video lectures for my international business course. They're a little outdated. It's been some time since I recorded them, and they're by no means, you know, best and perfect. The only reason they are on YouTube is because Canvas used to give me a limit of two gigabytes per semester at the time I recorded them and I could not put them on Canvas. So I had to put them on YouTube so my students can watch them and they're still there. And apparently some actually got quite a few views. So <laughs> if that helps, you're welcome to use them. So uh, who else? So Alex is not, re or recommends not to complicate things. I don't know, Anna Marie and then Toshia, what is your take on this? Yeah, I agree with Alexander that this is the moment to be pragmatic. But I also think that that could extend to the future. So I'm, I'm doing both. I am conducting my classes uh, through Zoom. Uh, so I have the students here presentially with me in Zoom, but I am recording it. So I'm recording it for any student who wants to go back, review the material, any student who couldn't be here uh, with me at the moment. But also I'm thinking about my own future. Uh, and I'm trying to keep these, these videos very organized so that they could be usable next semester. So uh, yeah, kind of the two birds with one stone. Uh, you know, have the class now for the moment, but also thinking of my own future, saving my own time. Um, so no, am I, I am not an online expert. I don't have anything fancy. I am just conducting my classes just like we're conducting this meeting right now. So there, I am not going to do any kind of editing. It's not going to be a professional video. But for, for my purposes, I think it works. I'm, I'm not going to be selling this class on Coursera or anything like that. It's for my own, my own purposes. Yeah. And it seems like it's not the last time we have to teach online, those who don't normally teach online. So, you know, maybe record once and use, reuse. Uh, Toshia, you had your uh, recommendation. How do you do it? Uh, you, your microphone is muted. Just a second. Uh, for some reason, the microphone keeps staying muted. Okay. okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, this is not a recommendation, just an observation. But uh, I initially, I started uh, teaching on campus uh, with a group of 80 students. And uh, then the university was forced to shut down. So I moved online. And uh, what, ha what I realized was that I mean, 80 students have different uh, attention levels to online classes. And uh, this is an undergraduate class, uh, third year student, I mean, in the US, I guess you call it senior. Yeah. And uh, I, well, th this is a gut feeling, I, uh, and uh, it's not statistically proven, but probably 10, 15% of the top students, they are listening because they prepared well in reading assignments and they can quite easily follow my online uh, discussions. However, uh, the next 40, 50% of the class, it's very difficult for me from my side to follow whether they are really understanding our discussion or my lecture. And uh, I can clearly see that uh, the last, I mean, remaining 20, 30% of the students really gone somewhere. So this is a very difficult situation and I'm really keen to learn about how I can mobilize the entire classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, yeah. And I see we started getting questions in Q&A. So Paula, Hamad, we see your questions. We'll get to them in a minute. Let us finish the video lecturing part. So um, any other advice on using the video lectures? Uh, I don't know, Ernesto? Yes, uh, my experience is, uh, is very similar. 
uh, to the one by uh, Toshia, if I'm pronouncing uh, correctly your name, uh, because actually I was starting uh, lecturing on campus and then I was forced to, we were forced to shut down, so I had to, I had to move online abruptly. And I was actually asking the advice of, uh, of us and, uh, and other colleagues, and uh, I found myself very well with Zoom. Uh, so I am conducting lectures for Zoom like this one. So I see... Zoom live, right? Yes, Zoom, uh, uh, yes, live, exactly. Uh, so the students are here. Uh, I appreciate it very much. I have to say that I am more satisfied lecturing online than in my usual class. Uh, for example, for one reason, because I can associate very well the face of the student with the name. And if you have so many foreign students, it is not very easy. I have 50 of them. I am not very good with names, I have to say. And so I see the student with the name. I am recording the lecture. And later on, I am uploading the, the, just the audio, not the, the video, because it's too heavy and I can use the slides very easily, I can show them a video, uh, so this is something that uh, I, I like very much. Uh, something that I am uh, sometimes in doubt, uh, I don't know how much to, to force students to take the camera on, because of course you cannot force people to take the camera home be on because they are in their home or in an uncomfortable situation or whatever. Yeah. So many shy students prefer to have the, the black screen. I don't like really that. So I don't know, for example, your experience, how much we should, I don't want to say force or invite them to keep the camera on. Because you, you don't want yeah. to be there in a black screen, you don't see anyone. I prefer to, to see people so that I can ask a question. And it can be, uh, it is more intimate than, than in a class because we are all here on the screen. Uh, I have to say that uh, teaching online uh, with Zoom is better than uh, my traditional uh, uh, lecturing. So I am really uh, satisfied as far as, on, as far as the student keep a camera on and they can see them because otherwise uh, uh, it doesn't work. Ernesto, that's a very interesting point, but I have a question. Yes. If you have a big class, like, I mean, 80 students that I had. Yeah. Ch can you still recognize 80 students in the divided desk? Uh, yes, I, I, I am lucky because I have no more than 35. And uh, maybe not all are coming. So let's say 30 students might be there. And with 30 students with two screens on Zoom, you can see all of them. Uh, and the one that is speaking, the, the, the screen is getting larger. And I like that uh, very much. But again, my only issue is uh, many students want to, don't want to, sh to show themselves. Yeah. But I think this is bad. And I'm thinking how to convince them to keep the camera on. Yeah. On the opposite, I think it is really a bad idea uh, to just uh, record a very nice lecturing and then uploading it. Because as Alex was suggesting, there are wonderful videos by us and better professor than me, so you can go there and see the, the video. So what is important is having some level of uh, interaction. And uh, so just recording, I know that many professors prefer recording because they are afraid about their pronunciation, about, uh, so they prefer to make an amazing video and then uploading it. But I think this is, uh, this is bad in a way, and it is better to have something live. So this is my uh, experience. But I am interested to know your view about the camera because I think this is something important. Yeah, if I may, so my experience is I use recorded lectures just because my classes tend to be very large. And on the one hand, I will not be able to see all the students anyway. And on the other hand, there will be always someone whose camera is not working, whose microphone is not working, who is not available at that time. And so I record the videos. And so this way they can watch them anytime they want. And one little trick that I do to sort of prompt the students to watch, watch the videos is every 10 minutes, I show a question, multiple choice question in the video that is very likely to appear on the exam. And so literally I would talk for 10 minutes and then I say, here is a question that tests the last 10 minutes and it's likely to appear on the exam. And so if you watch my video lectures, you kind of get a preview of some of the exam questions. There would be like five of them per lecture. Uh, 
And so this way, if they watch the video lectures, they know some of the questions. They also are more prepared for the exam. And so this way, I sort of kind of prompt them to, to, to watch those lectures instead of just reading the book. The problem, obviously, is that I do not see my students. And I, I teach in a relatively small town. And I used to have sometimes up to 200 students in a given semester. And anywhere I go, a store, a restaurant, or just on the street, like every three, four days, uh, this happens to me. I would be walking, and then someone wait a second, you're my professor from that video lecture. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, which course are you taking? So, but yeah, unfortunately it's kind of one-sided, but it seems to do the trick. And as Anna Marie said, you know, once you record them once, they serve you at least for several semesters. I do re-record -re them from time to time, but um, it does help. Oh, and another thing I do as a trick, it, it get a lot of positive feedback from the students. Ernesto said that as well. Uh, so even though I do have a video lecture, I also then extract only the soundtrack and post that as a separate file. And many students say that they appreciate that very much because they can then listen to video lectures as they are driving to work or biking or jogging or cleaning the house. Uh, international business, we don't really need to have many formulas or anything like that. So if there is a picture that is on the screen that needs to be seen, I usually just describe that in a little bit more uh, words in case students have to listen to it later on and they don't see the picture. And so that audio part, uh, many students say that that's the one that they actually prefer. So. Uh, Bus, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, does Zoom have a function in which you can use ah. uh, to ask questions? Yes, yeah, Zoom does have that function, but let's get to that. So what tools do you use to record video lectures? And so Zoom could be one of the tools, including the um, asking questions during the lecture. But I don't know, what is your technical sort of advice on recording the lectures? How do you do it? Well, firstly, I didn't record, I, I delivered on, uh, class online because we didn't have time to record anything. I mean, we were forced all of a sudden to move from uh, in-class lecture to online delivery. But I mean, uh, in my case, I didn't know about the Zoom function. So I used two things. One was the Zoom to deliver class online. And uh, then I also used Padlet. Uh, do you know any, does anybody know Padlet? Uh, Padlet, uh, Padlet is a very uh, interesting uh, tool to uh, have a two-way communications with students. So I did ask questions on Padlet and students started writing in, uh, on the Padlet. It's like, a, a, well, it's, it's just like a chatting, com chatting things. But I mean, uh, the good thing about Padlet is that, I mean, you can organize discussion under the uh, different themes, themes. So I, I used both, but I, I didn't know about Zoom functions. Uh, so if I can do it by Zoom, that's probably much easier. My understanding is that in Zoom, yes, we can ask questions, we can have polls, we can display answers, but only for the live version, obviously. So only when students are watching us live. So if it's a pre-recorded lecture, I know Canvas, I, ha I don't use it, but I did take a class. And so Canvas allows you to have quizzes during the video lectures, uh, it would have to go, there is an add-on, um, I forgot what it is called, but there is an add-on in Canvas that allows you to do that. And then even though the lecture is recorded, the, the quiz, the questions can go as if it's going live. And I'm not sure if anybody tried more uh, experimenting with that. Um, so I know it's doable in Canvas. Okay, so I want to jump in with a quick comment, yeah. and that is there's an assumption here that resources are plentiful and yeah. can support so here in Thailand, for example, bandwidth is a problem. Uh, some of the uh, instructors have tried to do uh, classes live, Zoom, and yeah. there's, there's other kind of software packages that allow you to do that, online streaming and so forth. But we can't do it because there's, not, there's insufficient bandwidth. So we're kind of forced to do recording, despite yeah. the fact that some uh, instructors are trying to do live, which uh, they're struggling to do. Um, the other one is budget. Well, we have a budget of zero, right? And so we're looking for free tools and open source software to help us solve these problems. Uh, so if, if you have creative ideas on how to solve some of these things for a budget of zero and limited bandwidth, I'd be very open to your thoughts and comments. And, and we'll get to that in a second because you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the question that we get a lot is, are there any free tools to do this, to use it? And so I'll definitely would, will want to ask you all to help with that. Uh, let's finish one more recording video lectures, what you do, and then we'll get to Justin's question because it's a very important one. Uh, Alka, I see you're raising your hand. So uh, your advice. 
So uh, I just want to share as to what, uh, which tools we are using in our university. We have started using MS Teams. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, it's a free uh, tool and uh, the classes can be again conducted online. And uh, we, so we, again, we have one-to-one -one interaction with the students. And what I've experienced in the uh, last few days is that if the class size is small, then it is actually, uh, you know, you actually can have one-to-one -one interaction with the students. Uh, and the, on the other hand, if the class size is huge, maybe if we have to uh, have, if there are around 50 students in the class, then uh, as the other speakers were saying, it is very difficult to uh, ensure that each one of uh, them is listening to you or not. So I've started using a trick. As uh, Professor Vas was also saying, so what I do is, I'm in the middle of a lecture, I'll uh, pose a question. And I tell all of them to uh, send me the answer at the same time. So I'll tell them you have to send uh, send the answer, maybe at 12.50. So now they cannot look at the answer of the other students and uh, whosoever is responding, we also try and uh, compensate them in terms of internal evaluation and other things because that is again one of the components. Uh, as far as the evaluation of the student, uh, student is concerned. So it helps me uh, essentially ensuring that uh, everyone is attentive throughout the class and again since it's part of the evaluation so they they are very prompt in answering the questions also yeah yeah makes perfect sense yeah um uh tt yes please go ahead uh, at the studio business school we have used canvas uh, yeah. uh, but now we added this canvas conferences actively so my view is that uh, uh, you have to combine uh, this uh, real time and asynchronous tools. So uh, I have seen uh, during this week that uh, some people who have not been in online uh, conferences before, I mean also students, they get tired. So maybe what I have tried, let's say after 30, 40 minutes, uh, I asked them to do something else in Canvas. For instance, they have to uh, uh, fill in some um, discussion forum, uh, insert something to discussion forum or or check, read some uh, short case and then we come back. Uh, but what I see a great value in this um, uh, real-time activity is really this breakout rooms. These are, yeah. a, uh, they are available both here in Zoom, they yes. are also available uh, in Canvas conferences, which is based on the big blue button. And uh, I think, uh, at least in my own of my international class, students were uh, really very enthusiastic in these breakout rooms. So, yeah. so, and you can then go and check what they are doing in the, each room. And even I would argue that if you have a small training room uh, and you happen to have, let's say, 40, 50, students maybe to make 10 uh, breakout uh, rooms yeah uh, and to ask them to do something uh, half an hour then come back to the mainstream it is even more efficient than uh, in a physical uh, physical uh, space Absolutely. and finally about this video i am not so big enthusiast of this uh, speaking heads so so i think uh, there is enough uh, videos to be watched in YouTube. Right, right. Uh, but but uh, why we do recording? Because we work with uh, we work with working students mostly. And even now during the crisis, some people have to do some work or are at the workplace. Uh, so so they can afterwards take a look on the recorders. Exactly. Yeah. If I may share my philosophy on recording lectures. Uh, I've used two different tools. Um, I started using Camtasia, which is a relatively expensive software. It's like up to $1,000 for the full package. Uh, luckily, our school provides it. And Camtasia allows you to record your slides and your face at the same time, kind of two streams. Uh, and then once the video is recorded, you have to edit it so you can cut out parts that are not important. You can move your head anywhere on the screen. You can add all kinds of graphics and call outs and all kinds, like very, very powerful. Like you can, you can literally make videos that look like, I don't know, Discovery Channel style or, you know, PBS, whatever that is. So the problem with that approach is that it takes a long time to create the video. Uh, for me, usually it takes pretty much the whole day to create a good Camtasia video because the recording itself will be a couple of 
of hours because you pause, you redo some parts, preparation, then video editing, cutting, then a couple of hours rendering, then posting. You can probably do one lecture a day. So if you want to record, you know, the standard course, you know, 15, 16 lectures, it will pretty much take you two weeks of nothing else but recording those videos. Lately, I've been sort of cheating a little bit. So instead of using Camtasia and going through this long elaborate process, I would record video lectures, for example, using Zoom record function, or you can just use anything else that records it. And I do it in one continuous take without any editing. So if I need to show something instead of the talking head, because uh, Zoom does not allow you to use the talking head and slides at the same time in the recording. So what I do is I would just alternate between my fa face and then I would switch to the slide when I need to show the slide. And so this way it's as if I record it in the classroom. So it takes roughly, let's say two hours with everything if the video lecture is about an hour, hour and a half. So in that case, uh, you save you a lot of time, but it doesn't look so nice. I also tried in, the, my, in my early years of teaching online, I also tried recording myself in the classroom, literally would put the camera and stand in front of the blackboard during the real class session. I thought that would make it a little bit more fun because the students would feel as if they are in the classroom. But in that case, I noticed the sound is not as good because the microphone and the camera are a little further away. And then especially if it's during the real class, somebody makes a comment, somebody coughs, like it becomes a little too, like it's not quite the same quality, not quite the same, you know, um, uh, feel as I thought it would be. So uh, quick zoom, if you have the resources, uh, use um, um, Canva, I mean Camtasia or something like that, or iMovie takes much longer, but will be a much better quality. But let me get back to Justin's question, and I see we have a few questions here in the in the chat room. So, any recommendations in terms of the free tools for teaching online? And there are two things that we get questions about all the time. One what platform do you use? Like for example, Canvas is not free. In fact, it's extremely expensive. We wanted to use Canvas for Exculture. And if it's not a university provided, like if you want to allow everyone to participate, the free version is extremely limited. Like you, you really cannot do anything there. But the more functional, function, like we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, depending on how many students you have. Uh, so any recommendations for tools like Canvas or Blackboard, but free? And any recommendations for tools like Camtasia, for recording high quality video lectures, but also free. And I don't know the answer, I'm actually curious. So uh, Toshia, you were raising your hand. Did I see that right? Yes, uh, as, I, as, I, uh, as I told you, uh, I did use uh, Padlet. I, I tried to show this. Uh, how do you me. spell that? What is Padlet? P-A-D-L-E. Mm -hmm. uh, Padlet, okay, yeah, yeah, yep, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is a screen. Uh, are you seeing this screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is yep. screen that I actually uh, comes from what I used. Uh, the good thing about Padlet is that I mean we can really talk intelligently between students and me. Uh, I, I raise questions and then students start writing down their comments, and I can see who wrote these uh, comments. So I incentivize them to write aggressively as possible by telling them that I mean, I'm recording their names uh, so that I can give the class participations. And they're very, uh, uh, very proactive in uh, responding to my questions. And uh, the key point is that under Padlet, you can really uh, nicely organize lots of different questions. And also you can put, update uh, your files, presentation files as well. And, and it's the, free, right? It, it does free. Yes, it's free. Okay, okay. So I, I, I do, uh, well, I learned this Padlet when I was teaching at Copenhagen Business School last year, uh, because CBS, many, many professors have been using this, uh, not only for classroom, but also for uh, uh, workshop seminars and other things. Okay, okay, interesting. Any other free tools that we can use? Any recommendations? Okay, so a quick a quick comment uh, from me. Uh, as, obviously, oh, yeah, go ahead. go ahead, Justin. Okay, so the budget here is limited, as I mentioned. So I'm trying to cobble together free things. So someone mentioned about recording. I found an open source software called OBS Studio. So I've used that. To OBS to Studio. Do. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty, it's very high powerful. Uh, actually, some professional organizations use it, but it's open source. So you can feel free to use it if you wish. Um, and also to share the lectures, slides, and, and so forth with my students because we have no LMS system. So there is no Canvas, no Blackboard here. I just use something, uh, either Dropbox sometimes I've used, or 
um, you can use Google Drive. That's the one that students like, uh, it seems here. So that's just a simple way of putting all your things in, in one spot for them. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Um, any other tools? Um, yeah, Anna Maria, I, I don't know. Just unmute your microphone and go ahead, please. Yeah, I am using Mentimeter for the presentations. Are you all familiar with Mentimeter? No. No. Should I, I can share my screen? Yeah, if you can show what it is, yeah. And while Anna Maria, yeah, okay, here it is. Here. Um, so let's, let me see if I can, sorry, let me move to something. So Mentimeter, it, the basic subscription is free. Um, let me show you types of questions. So it includes some questions. The questions are anonymous. So it will not work for evaluation of the students, but it does work to get an idea um, of the, who's paying attention and how much understanding there is. So the, the uh, free subscription only permits, I think, three questions per presentation but the number of presentations is unlimited. So we have multiple choice, word clouds, open-ended questions, uh, images, rankings, sliding scales. So it's kind of like I click or just uh, online. Exactly, integrated. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, quizzes, and then the kinds of, and it gives you the templates of different types of um, presentation slides. So I can get, show you a couple of mine. I always, since it is important to have different methods, not again, not the talking head, I always, I have some, I don't know, here's my Heimer slide. So a very quick slide of uh, the topic. I will discuss it. Um, let's see, there's a word cloud that they did on this. And then I always use this slide for articles. So whenever they see the man with the newspaper, they know uh, the article. And then I just keep collecting these articles. So I use the same presentation semester after semester. I just rotate the articles when I find what happened to find them. Yeah. And then I can have some questions. So obviously we would probably stop the video or the lecture since we're doing it uh, online now. I would probably stop now. Okay, this is as far as we're going to go for today. Your homework is to read these um, these articles, and we'll meet again whenever the next session. And then the next session would begin with a little quiz. Yeah, yeah, that's actually uh, so. Uh, Mentimeter, so good to know. Yeah. Mentimeter. Here's an example. So we have uh, the possibility of doing a matrix. So they have their CSA FSA matrix. Uh, I also have always have this um, this slide of related videos. So whenever they see the people sitting in a theater, they know that there are going to be some videos, and I uh, relate some YouTube videos that they can watch later. Yeah, yeah. So I am using this. So I am on Zoom. I am sharing my screen with them, showing them this presentation. They are watching the presentation uh, and can either be answering the questions on their phone or on the computer uh, at the same time. I record all of this and then I upload the video and the audio in Drive. So yeah. we have a shared folder for per class in Drive. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, any that's other right. tips on free tools? Um, Alex, go ahead, please, yeah. I would just say with the free tools, I, if you do, are in discussions or do have texts from publishers, reach out to them. At the moment, they're all giving free access to their LMS systems to at least the end of the semester. Yeah, yeah. Even if you weren't part of the, even if you weren't using the actual group. So I've got um, student uh, professors who were not using Pearson, for example, uh, McGraw, get, McGraw Hill gave them access to the IB. Yeah, yeah so that's a good idea. Just a matter of asking them, and, and everyone is going to give you free access to um, their LMS systems, yeah. again, at least to the end of the semester. Yeah. One quick solution I found, I'm involved with um, 
at the uh, Vilnius University of Lithuania this semester. And so they use Moodle, which apparently actually is free, but I don't like it. it. It's not a very good program, at least compared to Canvas or Blackboard. And so what I did with the students to be able to share their resources with them, I put everything in Dropbox and for every lecture, I just provided the links directly in the syllabus. So for example, introduction uh, session, click here and watch it on YouTube. Uh, first uh, lecture, political systems. Here is the video lecture. Here is the homework submitted here. I do it through Qualtrics just because I have the subscription, but it can be Google Forms, doesn't matter. And here are the slides and readings for this lecture. And then next thing, so basically all of the materials are directly linked in the syllabus. And so the syllabus, the PDF file almost becomes the, you know, course management system essentially. So you just have all of the links directly in the syllabus to all the materials you need. And so it's a very easy, cheap, simple way. And then if I have to make changes, I just make changes to the file in my Dropbox. And so when they click on the link, they see the latest file. So that's a very simple kind of quick solution if you don't have Canvas or Blackboard, or if you don't like Moodle like me and you don't want to post stuff there. So. Um, we get a lot of questions about evaluation. So obviously when you're in the classroom, you can talk to the students, you can give them the exam, you can make sure that during the exam, they're not cheating, not cooperating with friends. If it's online, it basically becomes everything open book, open notes. How do you know if they're participating? So what would you recommend to the professors in terms of evaluation? How do you make sure that students stay engaged and that they themselves do the exams? And do you give any participation points? Uh, Bas, I have a question to you. Yes. Uh, evaluation consists of different uh, elements, you know, class participation, right, right. Uh, or exams, or essays and whatever. What's your question? That's a good one. Let, let's go, let's do them one by one. So one that professors did ask me, in fact, Justin was one of the um, people who asked that a few days ago uh, on Facebook, exams. So when your students are writing the exam from home, uh, how do you ensure that they do not cheat? And again, I know there are platforms, not platforms, services where you can pay per student and a proctor will watch the student on a video camera during the exam, but that's like $15 per exam per student. So again, not everyone has those resources. So what do you do to ensure that the students uh, do not uh, cheat? Uh, I suppose there is really no easy way to make sure that they do not use textbooks, but what prevents them, for example, from teaming up and like five students take the test, the first one takes the test, everybody takes the snapshots of the screen and then they know the questions, then they prepare the answers. Like what do you do to prevent cheating on the exams when they're taken online? Any, to, well, any tricks? If yes, I can, yeah. thus, uh, to be honest, as I was actually forced to move online due to the coronavirus at the very last minute, uh, I was actually not organized for this event. So in my courses, uh, the evaluation 40% is based on X-Culture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and inside X-Culture, we have all those variables that we use. I don't want to go into the details. And then 60% was supposed to be a written exam yeah. Uh, with questions about the textbook. So right now, I am, uh, let's say, hoping that the university is going to open again in June and so that we can have the, uh, the normal exam. This is the expectation right now. It might open in May. This is what we hope, but uh, I, I start to be in doubt these, uh, these days. So I actually have to think about something, uh, something new. Uh, for example, in my international business strategy course, where I have a limited number of students, uh, they have to write a paper about a topic. Uh, so I base my evaluation, they have to choose a multinational company, and they have to, to write a paper about the strategy of that company. So I base that on the originality, the clarity of the writing, they have to do a small presentation. But actually, in the international marketing course, they were supposed to take a written exam with some, uh, some questions. So really, I don't know what to do. I give them some yeah. exercises during uh, uh, the week, especially at the beginning of the course, and they have to answer by email. So yes, they might cheat, they might have some discussion, but this is mainly to stimulate them. So it is not really part of the exam, even if I give them some points in the end. But actually, I still don't know how to run an exam uh, remotely. Uh, there is a discussion in my university that we have to give them uh, through Skype. So it is supposed to be online and it is me and another professor and the student is on the other side. We record it. Yes, you might have a book somewhere or the slides on the wall, I don't know, uh, but actually you can see him or her 
and this is actually the recommendation that we have right now on Skype, online, recording, oral, not written. Uh, but if there were another a better solution than, than Skype, uh, I am open to your advice. But right now we use Skype. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes, Toshia. Uh, I'm curious too, actually. Uh, in my course, I already gave a midterm exam online. And uh, I struggled actually to give what kind of exam I should be giving to the students. And my case, in my case, I used Save Monkey. Again, it's a freebie thing. And, How do you spell uh, that? And, and by the way, so there is a question from Paula about the names of the tools. So Paula and everybody, if you guys can put your email addresses in the comments window, I will make sure to send you first the recording of this session, but also the slides, the names of the tools. Uh, we have some resources that I'll just put in a gigantic drop box and everybody who puts the email address in the comments, we will send you those materials. Uh, but Toshia, how do you spell that, that tool name? Uh, Save Monkey. Uh -huh. oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Survey Monkey. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yes. Yeah, of course. And uh, I basically forced students to sit in front of their computers online. And uh, I provided uh, roughly 60 questions for 50 minutes. So students, yeah. in the end of the day, really didn't have a time to collude, collude I think. Yes. So, uh, but uh, I did... Uh, uh, agreed that this is an open-ended uh, no, open notebook exam. So probably they can still Google to, uh, to find them. But I mean, the key question is, I mean, key point is that just pressure them to answer a lot of questions. In my case, I offered primary multiple choices and uh, going over 60 questions uh, within 50 minutes is really hard time for many of them. So in the end of the day, I think, I mean, I can more or less, I mean, make a fairly decent assessment of the students' evaluation, at least from a mid-term mid exam point of view. But I'm still globe, I mean, exploring what is the best way for me to provide a, a final exam. So I'm yeah. really keen to learn about your observations. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, okay, um, so I'll come, go ahead, and then Jennifer. Uh, our university have been uh, also offering a lot of management programs through distance learning mode uh, since last four or five years. So the technique they have been using is, first of all, they have, again, as uh, Toshia was saying, that they give a lot of uh, MCQs. And uh, in the second section, they give a lot of practical case studies, yeah. for which they cannot find the answers directly on the internet. And then in the third section, they have few direct and indirect questions. So that is how they try and ensure that there is no scope for them to search for the answers on the internet. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, you had a comment? Yeah, I would just say it's a great time to reconsider our historical traditions of high stakes exams at the end of the yeah. semester. And I would negotiate with your supervisors if you have a high stakes exam already under your belt to say we've done that and to switch your uh, percentages if you have that freedom at your institution um, to weight things differently uh, in a way that's not hugely violating yeah. of the psychological contract for students and to really think about what's the, what's the learning that you want students to demonstrate and is there another way to do that that makes it easy for you. So for instance, in, you might have people record videos for you um, instead of uh, writing an exam. You should think about for you from your perspective, we're gonna get more and more overloaded. And so how can you be efficient? That was one of the questions we yeah. were asked to consider. So what's actually doable um, with your resources and in your institutional reality? So I would just say, really take a moment and ask what you actually need and how many people you have to um, evaluate. Yeah. What's interesting, my university canceled teaching evaluations for this semester. So they sort of expected that the students will not be very happy. So in a sense, we can try to experiment with some things that, you know, otherwise we would be afraid to, but this time we could. Uh, my, what I do, I do actually some similar to Toshia. Um, I give my students usually 75 questions in 90 minutes. 
and there is a timed window so they cannot you know they don't have much time but also i use canvas but i think you can do the same things in every course management system and uh same thing definitely you can do it in uh, qualtrics and in um, survey monkey where you can specify how many questions need to be selected from a larger pool and so what i do i have a pool of about 150 questions and i just tell the system that please select randomly 75 and show them during 90 minutes. And so this way, while it's possible for the students to collude, the questions come in very quickly and they appear in a different order for different students. And so usually, uh, you know, if they're familiar with the material, they can go through them pretty quickly and nicely. If they're not, it's not enough time to sort of cheat. And I do say open books, open notes, so review your books right before the exam, I don't mind. But again, you have to be pretty familiar with this <clears throat> to be able to find those answers very quickly. <clears throat> So it's possible so, that they collude, but I guess, you know, uh, would be so one, one quick, quick yeah. question. Uh, I think Ernesto mentioned that his class size was relatively small. Yeah. Well, I've teaching class sizes that are hundreds, right? Yeah. So you need something that's scalable. You can't have an essay or a, at least yeah, not in my true. case. And, and so this random thing or um, uh, the idea of presenting more questions they could possibly do and then scale the grade at the end. Yeah. I think we need to be very creative in how we make these scalable assessments. That's all. Yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. Um, Alka, you have a question, go ahead, please. No, I just want to share uh, my experience with you. As I mentioned, that we are using your open uh, software called MS Teams, and they also have provisions for sharing notes, and also there is a tool called Poly, which you can use for conducting online quiz. And secondly, the month what of What is April, the name of the tool? Poly, P-O-L-L-Y. -L mm -hmm, mm -hmm, got it. And uh, next month, our university will be conducting exams online. So maybe after a month or so, we will have a better understanding as to what can be the most effective tools for uh, for ensuring that uh, the exams can be conducted online and wherein students also uh, do not get an opportunity to you know, indulge into cheating and similar other kind of things. Yeah, that's a good point. There is an interesting question from Paula, and I'm not sure if you have any experience with that. Paula is asking Musaba, uh, please share how you monetize your courses beyond the university che teaching. So has anyone ever tried to monetize courses, online courses? <laughs> I know that people tell we have some videos, we have hundreds of videos on the Xcultures YouTube channel, and we have some videos, including surprisingly like my lecture on immigration, for some reason has, I don't know what, what, how many views now, but it's like in hundreds of thousands. I have no idea who watches them and why that one is particularly popular. <clears throat> but people say once you have more than a thousand views per, per video, you can actually monetize it on YouTube. But again, I never quite explored it and I have no idea how much money that might be. So it just seems like it's just too much hassle and you probably cannot get rich of that anyway. But anyone tried that? I don't know. You, 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 you tried it? <laughs> Here is Dieter. Uh, we have not tried it at EBS, but we have a bit discussed it. But I just uh, got such an ad hoc idea. Maybe it could be such a lottery style that uh, we ask uh, really very small some from Lees who uh, just watch uh, certain uh, certain videos and even interact uh, uh, in some way, and uh, from these small sums we could pay uh, some kind of bonus uh, to students or non-students to give a small smart uh, contribution or answers in the best way certain quizzes. So uh, it could be <laughs> such a uh, education lottery that, okay, you pay maybe 10 US dollars or euros, but you can win 100. Yeah, <laughs> that becomes yeah, interesting. Another oh, thing- Just as an idea. For yeah, cooperation. Exactly. Another thing to consider, and I'm not sure if it's the same thing in every country, but in the United States, I think technically the courses that are developed at this university, they technically, I believe, are property of the university. I don't think I can just go ahead and sort of start selling them on the open market. I'm not sure how the legal system works, but I suspect there are some restrictions on that. I think if you are at a private university, you'll find a good business model and you can say that, okay, we are marketing people just uh, market the course and uh, some money goes to the university and uh, <laughs> the part of money goes to the offer. Yeah. One more question about, so we get a lot of questions from, uh, from people who are watching the, the session. Um, it would be much more convenient if you ask your questions in the Q&A window. You have a chat window and a Q&A. And so in Q&A, it's a little bit easier for us to manage them and see which ones we have answered and which ones we have not. 
And so um, before we get to the questions, one general question, any other tips and tricks that you use in your online courses to make them more engaging, more interesting, more useful, uh, more effective? Any, any other things that we didn't cover, exams, uh, videos, we talked about those, anything else that you do for the online? I'll say one quick thing, yeah. and particularly for folks moving to the online rapidly, my instructional designers have told us that you should really have things very well ordered and have a folder at the top of the section with it, whatever, with whatever LMS you're using saying, open this first. And really our instructional designers are saying, you need to have things very streamlined and very simple and very selective. And so having limited amounts of information because our students are very overloaded. And so really thinking about how you structure things. So having things with very explicit language about what it is and what it's used for, um, that's really important in the um, technology side. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, anything else? One, one last comment here about evaluation. I know we started off with exams, um, but I believe uh, Toshia, if I'm not Toshia-san yep. mentioned that, um, that there's other types of evaluations. So in terms of my group projects, normally I would have my students do group presentations and all I've told them is record it, post it online, and then I can download it. And so it's a quick and easy way of continuing that same type of project without any massive change to your course. Yeah. I would like to share with you a trick that I use and it's so powerful and so simple that um, it almost sometimes feels like I'm cheating. And I sometimes even feel a little uncomfortable revealing to people what I do because, um, well, let, let me tell you so, but um, again, I don't know how you will take it. So uh, there is a tool that everybody probably knows called Mail Merge. Mail Merge works with um, Outlook, uh, Word, and Excel. And so for all the courses I teach online, but I also do it for courses that I teach face-to-face, -face, but it's especially important for online. Um, I set up um, a mail merge. Uh, every week, uh, there is like a three-page personal performance review that every student gets. And so all that is, is that I have this gigantic Excel file. And the, in the Excel file, I have all my exams and every week we take home assignment. And then there are some bonuses. And then there are X culture. So there are like probably like 50, 60 columns with performance indicators, like every week, you know, homework, every week, ex, uh, ex culture, every week, uh, bonus questions that they can answer. So there are many things. And so I set up this long email where I say, for example, let's say, I don't know, I'll take Ernesto here. So the email will read literally like this, dear, and then in mail merge, I say, put the name here and it says, dear Ernesto. And then I say something like this, uh, I wish it was a face-to-face -face class so I can see you every week, but unfortunately it's online. So the best I can do, I can reach out to every student with a personal performance review. So, so far we had these assignments and this is what you got. On exam one, you got 95, very good job, congratulations. I'm very happy with your performance. Then on take-home assignment, you got 85, which is a pretty good grade. Although again, it's about 85th percentile for the course. And so I talked to you for like two pages. All of that is done completely automatically. I set it up years ago, all the formulas an Excel file not only calculates the grades but for comments like you know if your comment is above 90 say this if your comment is above 80 say this and so the students get like two three pages of very personal comments every single week the only problem with this approach is they love it obviously they always comment that I was the only one who took the time to talk to them every week the only problem is if you have a large class, it's so personal that they literally think that I type it up for every student personally. And many of them feel compelled to reply and respond to my comments. And then I get like, you know, if you have 100 students, you get like 50 emails with detailed responses to your comments. But again, that creates an impression that I literally take time and write a couple of pages every single week to my students. And I, you know, sort of pay attention to who, who's doing what. And so if you have not explored mail merge, it's free as long as you have, as long as you have Microsoft Office. And as I said, you can program it that it displays the right numbers in the right places, the right, right comments in the right places. And in the Excel file itself, where you keep the track, as I said, uh, very simple function if. So if this grade is this much, say this. If this grade is this much, say this. Or if it's missing, say this. So you can very easily program if and then, and you have multiple conditions. And as I said, a grade in assignments, like again, 
it's almost embarrassing to say, but for my take-home assignments, there would be usually 10 open-ended questions. And Excel allows you to write formulas. So you download the, 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 the homework assignments in Excel. It's open-ended. It comes, I usually use Qualtrics, but you can do the same thing in Canvas and Blackboard. And so you get this Excel with text and you program it so that if specific words appear in the, the answer and the length of the answer is this and this, then it gives you sort of points and says different comments. And so I can grade, I mean, again, don't tell that to my students, but I can grade a 200, like 200 student submissions open-ended, like five pages of essay. I can grade it literally with five clicks. Like, I mean, like literally it does it all automatically. All the formulas are already in Excel. I tested accuracy. I mean, hardly ever do I see something that I would have graded it differently than the automatic formula because it's short answers. It's not essays. It's like a paragraph each time. So you can do it pretty well. And then so literally like it takes me like 10 minutes to grade 200 submissions and send two page feedback to every student on every single question in the homework assignment, not general impressions on every single question. So that works extremely powerfully. As I said, the only problem there is that sometimes students, you know, kind of mis mis misconstrue it and they think that you literally wrote it. And so sometimes, and maybe once every four or five weeks, sometimes the formula kind of gives a little bit of an error there. So in a sense that some of the comments, like there was something in the question that you should have read and the formula didn't know that. And so sometimes the student would say, oh, but did you notice that I say that? And in that case, you just say, okay, let me read it again. Maybe I missed something. Again, if you have only 30 students, probably you don't need that. I mean, with that many or that few, you can do it manually if needed. But if you have a larger class and if you have to provide detailed personal comments to each, mail merge is the way to go. So um, you can also program it in Qualtrics in, a, in an even better way with the panels, but I assume not everybody uses Qualtrics at the level where you can code answers. So I guess that would be a little too complicated. So now we know that at North Carolina University, they have a secret artificial intelligence plan. Well, if it makes you feel better, I actually get teaching, teaching evaluations higher when I do it online than when I do it face to face. They say when you switch yes. from face to face to online, your teaching evaluations go down. But in my case, I think because of this personal touch, and it's not that they're better than my face-to-face, -face, it's they're better than everybody else's online. And so most other professors say, here are the readings, here are the exams, that's the online course. In my case, as I said, all this automated stuff allows you to do these uh, you know, wonderful things and students feel like they communicate with you every week. So yeah, and somebody shared here, yeah, that's exactly how mail merge works, yeah. So mail merge, you can also Google it in YouTube. There will be a lot of videos that in three minutes show you how mail, mail merge works. And so it, it's a very easy tool once you set it up. In fact, more difficult is to set up all the formulas in Excel because it sometimes takes a few iterations before you get it right so that all of the feedback and all of the grades are you know, properly done. But again, you can grade them manually. Nothing prevents you from doing that, no problem. But then you so, just send it, yeah, send it out through mail. So mail merge is a program in itself. It is not inside. Uh, itself. No, it's it's not a program. It's it's a tool in Microsoft Word. So if I show okay. it to you here, so let me share my screen again. So for example, this is the feedback I sent to my students last week. We only had an exam, so there is really not much here. But mail merge, that's uh, mailing. So uh, if you go to um, uh, ma mailings here, if you go to Microsoft Word, that's that's what it is. And so all you do here is you just start mail merge, you use an existing tool. So in my case, I would go to my, um, I would go to my uh, management 304, you know, my Excel, basically, you know, that's, that's the grades file. Then it automatically populates it. So if I do the preview, like, you know, uh, dear Francisco, dear, you know, and as you see, you know, Malet got 102 points, probably did the bonuses, got more than 200. So it, see, it automatically updates uh, all of the numbers. And at this time, it's not too much because we haven't done much in this course yet. And I must have opened some old file. But essentially, you kind of, it looks like this. So you say the program, put the first name here, put the grade here, put the comments here. And so it just populates this file and I put them sometimes in different colors so that it's more visible, but it is part of the standard Microsoft Word. So you don't have to install anything. Yes. It's part uh, now, of the Microsoft um, package. Now that you show me, I realize that I've been using it in the past. We just yeah. uh, were calling it with the Italian name, uh, yeah. but just to send a letter in my yeah, exactly. consulting activity, not for, for, for exactly. teaching. No. Exactly.
Okay, so one quick point. I do something similar, not with Microsoft, with some Office Libre, some free stuff. But the, the challenge is even with academic email addresses, because ultimately you have to send those out, the technical limitation, I believe, is about 500 emails yeah. in a 24 hour period. Yeah. So if you have lots of students like I do, you're going to reach that very quickly. So you have to That's true. Sort of plan ahead. And you're absolutely right. I did have a few times when uh, Google, my university email is uh, powered by Google. We have 500 a day. And so you send one and then you make a mistake and you have to send another correction and boom, they block you and you have to call your IT and say, oh, no, no, that was me, all legit. So that's, that's an inconvenience. Yeah, very true. Okay, any other um, comments? And so I'll, I'll go to the questions here. We have a lot of questions from people. Um, uh, how do you manage, for example, Leonor, one of our professors, is asking, how do you manage case study presentations by group followed by a discussion online? Have you tried that, presentations? For Exculture, uh, with the kids, we actually try to do presentations. But um, the problem, again, is obviously we can do it in Zoom. It's very easy to do. You know, the, the team presents, shows the slides. Everybody can ask questions. The discussion co can go either live or with questions and answers. But sometimes the technology is not working very well. So what I tried a few times is I would say the team, to tell the team to record the video lecture and send me the file. And I say, just send me the link to Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever you use. And then for the discussion, I would circulate those videos and ask students to discuss again in writing so that's when the technology sometimes may not be working and as you know for Exculture we have some participants from Africa from you know from some countries where you know again the bandwidth may not allow you to have a nice live meeting of 100 people at the same time so any other recommendations in that respect uh, Hamad is asking specifically what do you do when you struggle with the connectivity any advice on how to handle it when online is not um, working well for you Yes, um, uh, maybe I can report um, yes, our experience here uh, in Italy as we have gone to online into a matter of emergency. Uh, regarding my experience, I am in, in the city center of my town and here the signal is uh, pretty strong or, or enough. I don't know your standard. Here I have in uh, uh, download uh, 90 megabyte per second. Uh, maybe in other part of the world you have uh, higher than that, but it is um, uh, good enough for Zoom. Uh, but actually this is a big problem because uh, in some uh, rural part of Italy, uh, yes, the signal is not that strong on the student side or on the professor side. And if this is the situation, the only option that uh, you have is uploading stuff on the, on the web. So I, I cannot find other, other solution. Uh, but likely this is not in my experience and not of my students. But I have some colleagues that have been reporting this experience here in Italy. So in other places of the world might be worse. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. All right. Uh, there is a question from... Um, oh, uh, Toshia, you had a comment? No, no, no. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, there is a question. Uh, what tools do you use? I Oh, yes, I go ahead. Make okay. a, yeah, I wanted to make a quick uh, observation on this. Uh, we are using MS Team, and uh, there's a facility that we can uh, also record our lectures during the class time. So, if there is a connectivity issue, we shared the uh, lecture with the students who was not able to connect while the lecture was, was going on. So, that is one of the tools which we are using in our university. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, there is a question again about tools that allow to pull a set number of questions from a larger pool of questions and so present them in a random order. So um, just to show how I do it again, um, you can do it definitely it's about every um, survey platform. So sometimes I give my students questions via Canvas and in Canvas you literally have something what they call display logic here. And so when you go into this button here, you can choose how the questions are shown and you know, and literally it's just programmed for me here to show 20 questions from this large pool here for this particular question. The same tool is available in Canvas and Blackboard, at least the tools that I used, where when you design the test, you can specify that these use this, what they call question bank. So you put there like, let's say 100 questions or 150 questions, and then you say, 
randomly present or present in random order this many questions from this pool, for example, I don't know, 40 questions or 50 questions. And so again, we're, we're not going to go into the step-by-step -step guidelines, but it's pretty much available in SurveyMonkey, in Qualtrics, and all of the data collection tools, but also as part of the exam uh, options for the, uh, for the course management systems. Uh, definitely uh, Canvas and definitely Blackboard. I would be surprised if it's not available in Moodle or whatever other platforms we use. So it shouldn't be a difficult um, issue. Okay, um, so we have a few more questions, but they're fairly, little, you know, we, we touched upon those. Like for example, Stefan Gershevsky is asking, uh, are you using pre-recorded video lectures or live lectures? And we talked about that, but maybe let's do a show of hand. So how many of you use video lectures live? So synchronously where students are watching you live, raise your hand on the screen. So hopefully people will be able to see. So we have three out of uh, eight or nine. How many of you use pre-recorded video lectures? Uh, I use pre-recorded. And how many of you don't use any video in your online courses? Uh, one, okay, well, so you got the recommendations. All right, so um, a, a discussion. Uh, so Hamad is talking about what he calls pastures, but I think that's the breakout groups what he was talking about in, in Zoom. So again, many video conferencing software, and I actually tested a few of them allow you to allow students to sort of go and work in small groups. And so this way you may have like 20, 30 people in the lecture and then they break in groups of five and they would see only those five people and they can discuss, then they come back and then they can have like, I don't know, a group representative can present, you know, something to the team, uh, I mean, to the larger class. But I don't know any other ideas for how to allow students to work in teams in a live session beyond breakout groups? Well, as my course is, this course is taking part in Xculture and this teamwork, I try to, to keep the, the remaining part of the course on an individual base. So that's why I'm not using a teamwork. So for teamwork, I rely on Xculture and I am very happy with it. This is all I can say. Yeah. One thing I know that some professors have used, I didn't have the need for that, but it's possible. Uh, if, if Facebook is allowed in your country, uh, again, you can use Facebook Live and you can literally just, you know, tell students, okay, you know, create a Facebook account if you don't have one and you can stream the video live. The students can be discussing live again, you know, in the comments. And so that could be another way to do it. And it does create a recording that you can then download as an MP4 so that those who missed the, video, uh, the, the, the live session can watch their recording. Plus it stays in Facebook as well as a recording. You can use it later as well. So another thing I will say about, oh yes, Keith, go ahead, please. Unmute. For some reason, your microphone is okay. Should be work. Uh, no. I think. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. I just got uh, such an idea that uh, unfortunately this semester I don't have international business uh, groups, so I don't participate uh, this semester in X culture. But because not maybe to maybe get some more publicity to X culture, could it be so that? Could I run, for instance, some kind of uh, brainstorming type uh, of uh, joint exercise that students are asked to us to propose some business ideas, uh, just uh, which could uh, help to fight with uh, coronavirus. I don't mean medical. I mean more uh, maybe online solutions, maybe everything. What could uh, just uh, um, help people to adapt to new situation because I'm afraid that it doesn't go away by May and maybe we could start it in April in May you could uh, create such a very you know, compressed like form how uh, the business model or business idea should be presented not too long stories and yeah. everybody could just participate or ask students to participate either in teams or individually and then there could be a vote. Uh, students and experts let vote of which of these ideas uh, could be developed further. There have been a lot of requests also to do Xculture this summer. We usually don't do Xculture in the summer because we have the conferences. Yeah. This year the conferences probably will be canceled. And so maybe we should have, you know, combating the global epidemics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but no, simply, I, I think that could maybe create such a also public, uh, positive public relations to Xculture and get more students. Point, yeah. 
it could be uh, then expanded also to these students who are not uh, part of X culture this semester. That's a good point. Yes, uh, I can see that having my course linked to X culture has been uh, a really big help for my course because we were basically already part online, so it yes. was full ready, and all my colleagues were not. So I am grateful to X culture even more, and I think it is a big time for for promoting its culture even even more. Yeah. It's been and, great to, to be in. And by the way, those who are watching, if you're not from the Exculture family, uh, yes, you can add Exculture to your course and we will do a lot of evaluation for you. So we'll do a lot of weekly assessments and post-project assessments for you. We will definitely help you with the student engagement. Uh, it is all online. So in many cases, it may be actually a useful thing. Uh, Hamad is asking about audio tools and as far as the tools itself i guess you have a lot of built-in tools that allow you to record the audio i'll tell you this i experimented with the different hardware and i found that there is a big difference between the microphone in your laptop versus a professional microphone that you can buy like for example i use this snowball uh so that's you know like looks like this and so this one was something like 80 dollars and i was hesitating if i want to buy it or not but when i tested and i bought several of the microphones on amazon just to test which one you know if there is a difference uh, there was a big difference even for my untrained ear there is a difference in quality and then i also showed it to people who are musically more inclined and they were able to tell right away basically okay that was an expensive microphone that was a cheap one and that's definitely your built-in like phone microphone or maybe your so again if you do it a lot and if you have a budget for that it may be a good idea to buy a better microphone and a better camera so camera especially makes a huge difference again the built-in in the laptop uh, not the same thing as when you have like a real you know professional but it can get quickly expensive all right, so uh, let me review the remaining questions. Did we answer everything? But any last minute comments? We don't want to drag it on too long. So any last minute recommendations? Do we have a place to go? Uh, let, let's say you saw my post on Facebook. I said, I don't know how to do this. Can you help? Do we have a place to go to post things? Because obviously we have a community of people who are interested in helping each other. Like a, like a discussion board or something like that? Uh, uh, maybe it's a very good face, question. Facebook something, right? That's actually a very good question. No, we, <laughs> we don't. I mean, we, we have the Exculture website and there are comments, uh, you know, comment section below each post. And we have the Exculture Facebook page where we have, but that one is not a very good one for discussion because we have like, I don't know, quarter million people, uh, followers there. So sometimes it's like thousands and thousands of comments impossible to work. Sometimes it's nothing, but it may be a good idea to create some sort of like a discussion place where people can share tools and and, you know, Links. Is I'm, that what you I'm mean, Dr. Uh, even, yeah, even. I'm not trying to put him on the on the spot, but Ozaki-san, he was talking about Padlet. Is that yes. a spot? Yes. Is that a beginning? Right. W would that work? Oh, I think so. And I second uh, you, uh, Justin. Uh, that's a great idea. I mean, we, we can share our knowledge. I mean, also through some kind of a written uh, blog or whatever. Yeah. Plus, it would be a good idea to also share like syllabi, readings, uh, tools. I mean, again, I, I'm very happy to share my slides and things like that. So maybe if it, we could post it there, at least for the Exculture community, for the professors that are part of our network, but I suppose also for the larger world, why not? So that's a very good idea. I don't know. So maybe if uh, Toshia and Justin, if you can maybe, I don't know, think about the technical side. If you, well, what I mean is if you tell me what tools can be suitable for that, because the only thing I can think of is that if I put everything in Dropbox and then just share the link, I suppose that's another way. But maybe we can do it more interactive so that it can be done sort of, you know, more, you know, multiple ways. Yeah. So can you connect this or Ozaki-san? We, we, we will talk and, and we'll try and solve that if that's, if that's okay. I'm, I'm volunteering Ozaki-san. <laughs> <laughs> and Justin is very strong when it comes to technical. I mean, he like, he, he, he does some seriously technically advanced things. Uh, Justin, we, we, can, we can have an offline discussion. Uh, can, can I have your email address or how do I talk to each other? Justin. How about Voss, Voss will connect us? Yeah, I'll, I'll send an email to, to everybody. Yeah. So yeah, Great. and that's another thing. So we have about 809 professors as of this semester who have ever participated in Exculture. 12 of them unsubscribed from our updates and they participated years ago. 
but 790 something are still very actively you know participating and so i'm thinking you know again sharing textbooks sharing resources readings reading lists um, syllabi slides i'm sure many people will be happy to share that so we should probably provide a platform at least for our own internal network to share that and again, if some people from the outside come and ask for help or maybe share some resources. So it would be nice to find a platform where we can do that. And then also finding each other. Again, I do have the context of all 809 professors, but you know, Justin and, and Toshia, even though on my screen, you are right next to one another. Again, how do you find each other in, you know, so maybe we should have some sort of like a communication tool where people can reach out to one another. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, I think let's stop here. So um, unless there are any last minute comments and remarks, but I thought that was a very useful session. I'll send um, the recording to everybody as well as the list of the tools that have been mentioned to everybody who provided the email address. And those of you who are watching live, um, if you put your email address, we will put you on that list and you will receive the resources. And um, yeah, tomorrow um, also there were a lot of questions about working from home. So many of us got stuck in home quarantine. Uh, not able to literally leave the house or at least not able to go to the regular office. And so there have been an interesting discussions on Facebook and we started talking about, um, um, uh, you know, how do you structure your work day when you're working from home? To not be distracted by the refrigerator, by the kids, by the pets, uh, or just simply not, not staying in bed all day, all day. And so we have a few people who claim they know how to work from home effectively. I have a huge problem. I mean, I, I don't like working from home and uh, struggling with the kids being all around all the time, sometimes fighting, sometimes wanting to play. So we have another me meeting same time tomorrow. So if you want to share your tips and tricks and maybe also uh, see what others do, please do come. Um, I'll send you the link to tomorrow's session. And um, with your permission, I recorded this one. I'll share it also. Probably. I hope uh, in your location, you still can go jogging or hiking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I live in the park, so that is not a problem. But yeah. getting things done, that's the challenge. You know, jogging and playing, that's not a problem. Getting things done, that's a challenge. So hopefully we'll, we'll have some good tips tomorrow. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for your uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You much. Bye -bye. Greetings Bye -bye. to everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.